Hi YouTube and YouTube subscribers. My name is Natasha Gates and we're on part two of migraine and help me my migraine feels like I'm having a stroke which is the almighty hemiplegic migraine. So I feel a lot better than I did from yesterday. Um, yesterday I was having a classic common migraine without aura so I was having extreme pain and extreme aversion to foods and an extreme um, vertigo, which means dizziness. And I was just having this for three to four days straight. And now, hopefully today, um, I'll be alleviated from these symptoms. Very strangely, I, I hardly ever get common migraines. Usually they're the complicated migraines, such as the hemiplegic migraine, which is extremely scary. Um, so I'm very thankful that I didn't have to go through that. <laughs> um, before I start talking about the hemiplegic migraine, before I forget, I want to talk about what I do to eliminate my migraine through about almost 20 years of having hemiplegic migraines, I have found something that works for me. It's like 600 milligrams of Advil and orange juice. I don't know why the vitamin C works so well for me to like, it, it stops my migraine dead on, like in between. Like if I feel a migraine come on, I know that I need vitamin C. And it's interesting because I think that nutrition plays more into the diseases that we have more often than not. And the things that we put in our bodies really shine through, um, per se. Uh, like, I can have a vitamin C deficiency and not even know that that's what's causing my migraine, right? And then that would be kind of making my migraine due to something else besides its own entity, which would be like a secondary um, migraine instead of a primary categorization. But we talked about that in part one. So recap, migraines are a neurological disease. And they're a type of headache, yes, but it's completely different from a regular headache or a tension headache or a cluster headache, etc. There's a lot going on and researchers have found really that it's a combination between two things, which is serotonin levels fluctuating and between that, estrogen levels fluctuating. So what does that say? Especially the estrogen means what? Men don't suffer as much as women do from migraines. And that research holds some truth there because most migraine sufferers are women. So think about the validity from that. Um, I believe it because you know, if you're menstruating and your cycle's coming, if you're a woman, it doesn't matter if you identify as a woman, you're not biologically a woman. So this doesn't apply to people who say, I'm a woman, but you were born a male. So this is specific to a biological female that has levels of estrogen that fluctuate alongside the serotonin fluctuations. And then in turn, that would make the vasodilation, vasoconstriction pattern a lot worse. That's a philosophy. So what happens with the serotonin levels is that they narrow the blood vessels. So that's vasoconstriction, right? So it 
communicates between nerve cells and I'm not going to get like too into this because this is not like a biology um, lecture. I'm trying to make you understand hemiplegic migraines the best I can um, without going too crazy. Um, when serotonin or estrogen levels change in a body, the results in those changes would be a migraine for some people. But having said that, serotonin levels can affect both sexes. So males can be affected by fluctuating serotonin levels, but not the estrogen because fluctuating estrogen levels affect women, biological women only. So you are not a part of this if you are, again, identifying as a woman, but not a woman. Um, so what triggers migraines in general for most people is foods and drinks, like certain foods and drinks, weather changes, which I can definitely um, attest to, like really bright lights or flickering lights, like some odors um, such as like paint, um, perfume, hair dye, nail polish. What's another smell? Maybe it's the smell of a skunk. Um, most likely it's an artificial smell that would trigger your migraine because it's a toxin. Our, our world is filled with toxins in our environment and it's makes sense that our body would react to that in a negative way, right? Um, biological conditions has a lot to do with it. Um, and as I just said, like the emotional kind of like havoc going on with the hormonal shifts and serotonin levels and waves of fluctuations causing the migraine. And unfortunately, stress and anxiety will definitely amp up your chances of having a migraine and the prevalence of your migraine and the frequency, it's just the way it is. It's, it's a major part of why people get migraines and it's a trigger. And unfortunately for me, I get them all the time because I'm stressed out every single day. I have anxiety every day. I'm a chronic anxiety person, chronic panic. I'm just panicking all the time. It's just terrible existence. Let's go on. So we have two different kinds of migraines that are classified in the hemiplegic group, I should say. So we have familiar, which is like also called familial, like it is genetic, okay? So like someone else in your family had it, your mother, your grandma, someone that you know of in your family had it. And then number two is sporadic. So you have familial hemiplegic migraine, and then you'll have your sporadic hemiplegic migraine. So the sporadic is like, you're the first person in your family known to you, right? Because we have lots of ancestors before us. So you're the first person known to you that has had a hemiplegic migraine. So in my case, I'm sporadic. And in my son's case, because he inherited it from me, he has familial because of my background and history of having these terrible things. Hemiplegic migraines are really rare, okay? And of course, I've been hit with them. I don't know what I did to deserve all this crap in my life, but it's just what happens. So I hope that there's not a lot of people listening to this that actually deal with this because it's really scary. Um, there's no other way to like say it. Like it's not challenging. It's not something that 
is easy to deal with. It's, it's frightening. Um, the symptoms are frightening. Um, so let's get back to like explaining what hemiplegic means. So you're like hemiplegic. Okay. I really don't understand like what the hell she's talking about. Hemiplegic. I'll break it down for you again. Um, part one, I did a good job of breaking it down, I think, but let's take the word hemiplegic. So hemi is one side. So you have one side. Plegic is paralysis. So not being able to feel it. And basically you can look like this while you're having your hemiplegic migraine and thinking, oh my God, right? I got to call 911. That's legit, especially if you're having your first episode. If you're having your 10th episode, then calling 911 would probably not be the best idea, seeing that it would cause more stress and it would just be easier to pass your symptoms by at home and understanding that what you have is not necessarily life-threatening and you're not having a stroke because you have been evaluated previously, etc. So hemiplegic migraine is a migraine that affects one side of a body at a time now, don't get confused that it's, it's just going to affect one side because it could start on one side like it does for me, and then it can march all the way across my brain to the other side of the brain and onto the other side of my extremities, my limbs, you name it. It goes through my face, my tongue. So, it starts on one side and it usually ends on one side, so hence the word Hemi. So hemiplegic. You are going to have an experience of po like paralysis. So I had a time where my whole entire arm went completely dead. Like it was like dead. It wasn't even there, but I didn't have any aura symptoms going on at the time. So it was extra scary because I thought I was having a stroke or a heart attack silently, right? And I was only like 26, so I'm like, holy crap, what's going on? And that's when um, things started happening is when I was about 25 or 26 years old. So, yeah, that was really scary to experience. Um, hemiplegia itself in the migraine context is an aura symptom. So it's a sensory or a symptom. So it's something that you can feel or not feel in, in your body, your physiology. Um, like a visual aura, as you know, is something that you would see out of your eyes, like the lights and the zigzags and um, the lack of vision, that would be the visual aura. Um, weakness is associated as a symptom for hemiplegic migraines in general. Um, malaise, which means like you're lethargic or just really tired. Um, some people can have so much pain during these migraines that they throw up and they keep on throwing up or they have like severe nausea without vomiting. It can either be with vomiting, without vomiting, and that goes for all different kinds of migraines. Um, most people with migraines are very sensitive to lights, um, and I have that, and that that's called photophobia. So I like to keep all of my drapes closed and dark. I like dark rooms, and the sun really bothers me. I, I really don't go outside that much. Um, I wear sunglasses sometimes even in the house if it's really light outside. Yes, that might sound crazy, but you got to do what you got to do to protect yourself from having a trigger that causes these scary migraines. And then we have phonophobia, which is the loud sounds like you're sensitive to sound in general. So like when I'm watching TV, even my voice right now sounds loud to me and it's bothering me. So when I'm watching TV, 
I like to turn the volume down all the way during the commercials because when people are talking in the commercials, it's like so annoying to my brain. I can't stand it. So that's phonophobia. Okay. Um, in severe cases with people with uh, hemiplegic migraines, they just have weakness that is prolonged after their migraine is over. So that would be part of the postrome, right? Because remember, the, pr the prodrome is what happens before all of the stages of the migraine. And the postrome is the ending part of the migraine, like the migraine hangover. So in severe cases, um, hemiplegic migraines can even cause someone to go into a freaking coma, like for real. Um, that's, that scares me a lot. Um, you know, I have five children, so it's like, I'm not thinking about myself in this situation. I'm thinking about the dire need to kind of stay alive for my children, right? And like, I don't want them to be afraid of me laying in the hospital or not being able to function as a mother, et cetera. You understand. <laughs> so in other severe cases, um, people can have seizures from these events, um, just overall confusion, memory loss, and then behavioral changes. And then there's actually, they say, like a lot of researchers say there's no evidence of like brain damage, but then other ones, uh, researchers, they did found like, find uh, damage in certain parts of the brain that are that are compromised. And I think that comes out a lot in the way I speak because sometimes I can't think of a word or I say it incorrectly when I have a pretty good vocabulary bank. And I believe that every single hemiplegic migraine that I, that I have, it actually um, impacts my brain and has some kind of uh, hold on my brain and actually deteriorate, deteriorates. Um, my intellect in a lot of ways. I feel like my brain is compromised every time I have one of these episodes. And I think that that is true when those researchers have found that there's some brain damage done from these kind of migraine attacks. Um, like I said in part one, um, the speech dysphagia is a sign of having hemiplegic migraines, um, not being able to communicate and deliver your words the way that is normal or that the, the way that you need to deliver your words. So during an episode, for example, I would be saying, um, please, doctor, help, hospital, mom, driving me now, can't address me hospital like it would just be like a bunch of words coming out that could form a sentence but is called word salad as i said in in number one part one so that is a very very aggravating symptom of hemiplegic migraine for myself that when i want to say something i can't relay my my message to people so I understand like what people are feeling for the most part when they're having a stroke or a TIA which is a transient ischemic attack which is known as a mini stroke so that's one of the things that they screen you for actually um, when you're having hemiplegic migraines is that they give you a CAT scan and an MRI to make sure that there's no evidence of stroke or brain damage. Um, so far, all of my brain MRIs and CAT scans have come back without evidence of brain damage from a stroke or TIA. The thing with TIAs is that sometimes you have to catch it while it's happening while you're under imaging or else it really doesn't leave any evidence otherwise. So it's really tricky. Um, like, I know that researchers have found that 
see, that's another speech impediment that I have developed through having my brain being compromised. Um, intellectual disability is something that they believe that happens because of these migraine types. And I am living that. I mean, I, I can't publicly speak the way I used to and enunciate my words the way I used to and deliver my message as clearly as I'd like in a professional manner, right? So what causes this to happen, right? Like, well, neurologists say, well, we don't know. We know some things, but we don't, we don't know. It's a phenomenon, you know. Uh, is that enough for us to know? No, it's, it's not enough because we need more participants to participate into research studies so that we can actually find out the etiology of migraine and different migraines and how they happen. But unfortunately, people who suffer from migraines like myself usually are comorbid, meaning they have more than one diagnosis of like personality disorders or anxiety or, you know, things that prevent a person from being able to participate in these studies and leaving their house, such as myself, um, dealing with agoraphobic. Um, I should have said agoraphobia. I have a problem leaving the house. So yeah, I would be a really bad candidate to go get tested because sometimes I can't leave my house because I'm too nervous or I'm having a panic attack. So it's the lack of data and the lack of research that really puts a hold on finding out why these things happen. Some researchers argue that it's the hypersensitivity of nerves, which is called hyperexcitability, I believe. And I think it's a lot like fibromyalgia, you know, like you have these overexcited nerves and, you know, like I have fibromyalgia. So if you hit me a little bit with something, it hurts like hell, like honest to God. Like, if somebody goes like this, like, I'm, like, screaming bloody murder, but I keep it to myself because I was raised not to, like, whine about things so much. So let me take a little water break here, and I'm going to finish off this part two. That's another good preventative for migraines is make sure you stay hydrated. Always have water bottles with you. Um, never go without water because that would be a major trigger to have a migraine. So I think I should have a part three because I'm already going over 20 minutes here um, to talk about my own story with hemiplegic migraines and my relationship with them. Um, it's, it's quite a difficult thing to explain. So I think I'll just kind of finish up with a few more facts that there's no like standardized treatment for migraine, like hemiplegic migraine. It's just because there's such a dearth of data, like I said, or data, whichever one you like to use, data, data, about migraines in general that how are we supposed to know what kind of treatments work if there's no treatment trials going on? It's just a sad thing. I mean, we need more people to participate. And at this point, I would probably like to participate just so I can help other people try to figure out what helps and what's going to eradicate these symptoms. It's very scary. Um, so really... Hemiplegic migraines are going to affect females more than males because of the estrogen factor. Um, onset of this disorder is usually between the first or second decade of the lifespan, but you can actually develop this way later in life. It's, I mean, like in your 60s, really. I mean, that's what's wild about it. It can happen at any time which I hate because it's just like, it's just like a panic attack. It can happen at any time out of the blue, whenever it feels like it, 
just come on, hit me with something else, right? So what can you do to alleviate the pain and or the symptoms, sensations of these hemipelagic migraines? What can I do? Help me. I need help, right? So what I use is Advil. So that's an NSAID. So the difference between Tylenol and Advil, Tylenol gets rid of the pain, but not the inflammation, okay? So that wouldn't be a good choice. And then Advil gets rid of the pain and the inflammation. So which one's a better choice? The Advil, right? Yes. So you could probably take up to, I guess, 800 milligrams if you needed to. Um, but I, I don't like to overdose what is recommended on the puddle, which is just 200 milligrams. So during an attack, I'll take 600 milligrams for myself. But some people that I know take like way more than that. And I don't know why or what it's doing to their liver, but whatever. There's other medications that people use or, or they're administered in the hospital, which would be like your verafamil, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. Um, there's naloxone, even ketamine, verapamil, et cetera, et cetera. But there's, again, there's no set treatment that is written anywhere that says, you know, when somebody comes in with a hemiplegic migraine, this is what you should have. No, it's the doctor's decision upon what they know um, via research or from their own experiences or other patients' experience of what works because there's no, like I said, data saying this is what works for most patients. This is what you should give your patients. There's, we don't have that and that's terrible. So you have to kind of find out what works for yourself. And right now I'm getting dizzy. I'm having vertigo from my um, migraines that I've been having. And it's probably a lot of anxiety too because speaking about this is very anxiety provoking for me. So I'm going to stop this and I'm going to do a, a part three. And the part three is going to be on the hemiplegic migraine and how it affects me personally. So thank you for listening and I'll see you on part three.